Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to our latest interview blog. It's Natasha Hawker from Employee Matters. Now, as you know, we've dealt with hundreds of businesses over the years now, and what we do know is that a very small minority of businesses, and employees for that matter, actually have a great understanding about their financial management or well-being. And I found this stat fascinating. Did you know that at any one time in Australia, 38% of employees are very worried about their personal financial situation. And I wanted to pose the question to you, what would it mean to you if all of your employees had confidence about their well-being? So to discuss this and so much more, we are thrilled to have David Harvey from Shadforth Financial Group. Welcome, David. Great to be here. Thank you, Natasha. It's good to have you. I'm really excited about this and I, and, I, and I find it fascinating and I actually think we need to go back one step and teach it more in schools, but let's see where mm. our conversation takes us. So let's yep. start with you first. Tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get to sit where you're sitting today? Uh, good question. Um, uh, for the purposes of now, of now I'll, I'll sort of be brief, but I think I could probably break up the last 20 years into two different segments. The first First half, basically, that Natasha was um, providing advice in a one-to-one -one model. Mm. So that might have been around um, an equities por share portfolio or an equities portfolio. It might have been around a particular structured product, or it might have been around executive advice. Mm. And that was great, and it was exciting, and I got to help a lot of people. Uh, but in the last sort of 10 years or so, I've been more interested in the advice to many space. Mm -hmm. um, and on that basis, I've been really fortunate uh, to work for the last number of years here at Shadforth, in which we have a national team mm. that's really highly trained, highly educated, and, and we're dedicated and committed to providing advice to all Australians that, that want to participate. And want to get better at this sort of stuff. So that's fascinating. So tell me, I wanted to dig more into this statistic. 38%, that's over a third of your workforce in Australia at the moment, are panicking about their, their finances. Mm. Why do you think that's the case? Uh, look, it, I, I guess a couple of things. Firstly, the statistic is alarming. And I, I think, you know, it, it, it's almost a paradox. As our economy thrives mm -hmm. and this is this is consistent Natasha by the way across the developed world so it's not just Australia it's the UK it's the US it's, it's the other developed economies as our economies grow as our collars get white yep as we move up our vocational ladder there's a couple of things that happen the first thing that happens is we earn more but of mm -hmm. course we also spend more mm -hmm. and you know, there's the old adage of keeping up with the Joneses. So our expectations as a cohort, I've noticed this in school cohorts, I've noticed this in professional cohorts, and then in communities and society as a whole, our expectations have grown. Mm -hmm. Now, on the back of that, the statistics, as you mentioned, are really alarming. Here's another few. Mm -hmm. Two thirds of employees are doing without things they used to. So they're simply not buying them anymore. Half of them don't have more than a month's expenses Papa. saved for an emergency, so that's alarming. Half of them are carrying balances on credit cards month to month. That would make your eyes water. That would make your eyes water, and it's making their eyes water, and they're worried and concerned about it. A third of them now, and, for, and that number is growing, are consistently saying we're going to have to work longer. Mm. So that so again, I, I go back to the start. Yes, we're growing as an economy. Yes, these conversations are being had, which, which is a good thing. Mm. But the numbers are telling us that the problem, unfortunately, is getting it worse. Is getting worse. worse. So what? Yeah. Why are Australians and and it sounds like other OECD countries? Why are we mm. so challenged by understanding and I suppose managing our financials? Yeah, um, if you indulge me, I'll, I'll tell the story of, of when my mum and dad got married and, and they tell us the story all the time. And, and in fact, funnily enough, in inner, inner Sydney um, or in a little suburb in a Sydney, I go past their first wedding home every now and again. Mm. And it's a quaint 
cute little weatherboard. And there were a couple of bedrooms and they tell the story of being the first house in the street to have a car. They had one. Mm -hmm. They had one black and white TV. Yep. And it was a big deal when mum went to work. Mm. So all of a sudden they had two incomes, not just one. They lived a pretty simple life. Well, of course, Natasha, we contrast that now with, I look at, you know, uh, families now when they start out, there's multiple bedrooms, there's multiple cars, there's multiple screens, there's multiple jobs, and then obviously everything else comes with that. So I think, and the other part, of course, is we're all preparing for our own retirement, mm. which again, is these are all good things uh, on the face of it. However, it's all adding a layer of complexity. Mm. How do we balance all the things that we want now, all the expectations that we have now, and good luck, we should have those things, we should enjoy life. How do we balance that with mm. saving for a rainy day and then ultimately preparing for retirement? Now, that's some pretty serious math, you know, to comp yeah. contemplate. And at the same time, we've got jobs with pressures of their own and deadlines of their own. So I think when you add all that up, it kind of makes sense that Australians feel a little bit stuck and, and probably a bit apoplectic. And I think you're right there, David. I think it's around, you know what, retirement's so far away. I don't need to worry about yeah. that. And And I think we have got much more of a sort of, want it now, want it, you know, right away. And I think you're right, keeping up with the Joneses. I'm shocked. My kids go to a local public school. And, you know, all the kids have got their um, AirPods. They've got their 10X phone. Mum's like, my kids were saying, Mum, do you need a 10X? I'm like, I don't need a 10X. And there's kids there. Yeah. So I think there's, there is a push for that now and, and it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. So obviously there's an impact to the business where you've got employees with that sort of level of concern, what are those impacts as you see them? I think, I think again, you can probably break them up into two. I think there's the obvious or the tangible impacts. And then unfortunately, I think there's the, the ones that are not so obvious, a little more difficult to measure mm. uh, the intangible. So on, on the tangible side, there's plenty of research that shows that, and again, I'll give you a couple of numbers. Uh, PwC uh, have done this for the last number of years. There's, there's plenty of, of independent research, but, but just relying on the PwC studies, 44% of respondents uh, over the last financial year admitted spending time at work on their personal finances, and that average time is between five and six hours a week. Wow. Yeah. So half of the employees out there, and, and this is global, and we have a productivity okay. problem anyway in the workplace. A productivity yeah. problem anyway. So, and look, we speak with a lot of a lot of employers, and obviously, our team speaks with the employees themselves. And anecdotally, this is what we're hearing: turn up to work, get there at eight eight twenty nine, yep. log in, do our job, don't get fired, yep. don't get into trouble because we're under stress Can't at five oh one gone mm. at 501 gone and during that time they're spending as i said between five and six hours a week directly on their finances so they're opening up spreadsheets or they're looking at their budget or they're ringing credit card companies so that's the, that's the tangible cost and that's a concern mm. now that adds up to billions of dollars a year across the economy mm. but i'm more concerned or we're more concerned natasha about the intangible cost now I'll put my hand up and say, I've, we, we've all been under stress. Yep. And I know that personally when I'm under stress, my general decision-making ability decreases. And again, the research shows that. Mm. I'm certainly not innovating mm. in that space. I'm not thinking creativity, you know, creatively. Um, I might turn up to a meeting in person, but am I really there in spirit? Am I really you know, really passionate, driven, committed, you know, to what I'm doing. So I think that's, that's the concerning side. On the positive side, the employers that we're talking to realise this. Mm -hmm. They realise the tangible and the intangible cost. Um, and, the, you know, the other positive side, Australian companies today, Natasha, are spending $9 billion a year. That's $9,000 million a year on wellbeing. 
Yeah. Okay, so I guess the question to pose is for any employers out there, what you're already spending the money. That's great. Yeah. What what are the programs? Mm. What's the return on that investment for your people? Are you asking them? Mm. You know, is, is this landing for them? Is it a value? But then the other key consideration is in the, in the finance space, what, what are we doing around that? What are the engagement mechanisms that we might want to consider around empowering, equipping, and engaging our people in this area? So that's a great segue into the question that I had next, which is what are the top three things that um, both the employer and I'd also like to understand the employee could do to improve their financial uh, circumstances? Yeah, good question. I think I think for, for both, mm. I think for both, I think it's to be mindful as to where we're at. That that's the that's what the doesn't first, get measured doesn't get done. That's the first and most important part. And and you know that's you know the analogy is, is losing weight or getting fitter or stopping smoking or dealing with your financial well being. They can all fall under the category of just having a look. Mm. Just, just doing a pulse check. Now, for an employer, that can be across, um, obviously, the employee base, and, and there are a number of really simple tools, you know, that, that can do that, surveys, discussions, um, et cetera. But for the individual, for the employee, it's just having a look at where you're at, having a look personally, um, and then involving others, whether it's your significant other or your partner or your family, you know, who's important in your household and, and having that chat. I think the second part is once you've had, the, had a look, now say for example, you're an individual and you've had a look at your, your cash flow, you've had a look at your budget, and you've realized that there's more month at the end of your money yep. than money at the end of your month. So yep. therefore you've got a deficit. There's, mm. there's more going out than there is coming in. Well, that's okay. Mm. That's neither good nor bad. It is what it is. And I think what we're saying here is a well-being approach to budgeting, a well-being approach to cash flow is have a look, understand, and then start to deal with what are the tactics that we can, you know, we can, we can, I guess, implement to change that outcome. The last part, again, really important. Um, a mentor of mine always says, if not now, when? Mm. If not now, when? So I think... You know, I look outside today, the sun's um, shining, the sky's blue, the, the birds are chirping. So we, we feel more positive. But on a rainy day, um, you know, when times are a bit tough, when we're stressed at work or we're stressed at home and the financial stress is there as well, mm. don't be afraid to start. Those small little incremental steps will add up over time. Make a big difference. What about mm. from the employer perspective? How can they help? these clients or these, sorry, not clients, these employees? Yeah, it's a tough, it's a tough question. Um, and look, we, we have very, as you and I, Natasha, are, are chatting now, we have these very same frank, uh, empowering conversations with, with employers. I, I think, I think, again, we would start with the same sort of methodology. Have a look at what you're already doing in the well-being space in an overall sense. And, and Natasha, I know that you work with your clients from mm. that perspective. Mm. Just take a bit of a step back and have a look at what, what are you doing from an overall perspective. Mm. I'll give an example. A uh, city-based uh, employer group that we're working with does tremendous work in the well-being space. They're Offices are wonderful. It's like the hanging gardens of Babylon. They've got breakout rooms. They've got um, flexible meeting. They've got flexible working arrangements. But, you know, you name it, they've got it. And uh, earlier this year, they ran a mindfulness sort of period of time over a couple of months. Well, what we did there is we were able to sense check that some of the um, cohort was struggling in the, in the financial wellbeing space, struggling in that empowerment space. So we just blended a very positive message, a very empowering mes message around their finances and being mindful about money. Mm. Yeah. So I think it's a really good example of turning this conversation into an empowering, 
educational and, and equipping conversation, a really positive narrative around our finances. You wrote nothing, really bad, there's nothing bad and wrong with being under stress. There's nothing bad and wrong with normal. identifying that deficit that we spoke about before. It's about turning this into a positive narrative and a positive experience for the employee base. I think you raise a really good point. I worked for a business a couple of years ago that was a fairly large travel agency and mm. travel agents don't get paid that much money. And what they were yep. finding was their team was short at the end of every month. And mm. they were often coming to the business owners to say, can I have an advance? Cause I'm broke. And mm. they were very clever. And I think this is going back 10 years or so. And I think they were ahead of their time. They actually bought in some financial consultants to actually run mm. sort of an, a financial awareness, budgeting, you know, all of that sort of educational to try and mm. help their team manage their own finances more effectively. And mm -hmm. I thought that was really uh, very proactive and really insightful. Yeah, I think it's interesting you mentioned travel. You know, we, we, we get that a lot. And I think if we just sort of look at the industry as a whole, how we try and deal with this in the past with employer groups, oftentimes employers will say, oh, well, we've, we've got the default group super plan. Mm. Okay, now, we work in that space. So, so I'm not denigrating or I'm not running down the, um, you know, the efficacy of super when it comes to retirement. That's fine. However, for that generation that is probably a fair way off and, and maybe in the travel sort of space that you spoke about, that's the last thing they're thinking about. What they're thinking about at the moment is how do I get to that next trip to Turin? Yep. I want to buy um, a nicer car for my family. I want to save for a house deposit. Uh, and now that I've got some kids, I want to start to think about educating them. So that's, that's paramount and important now mm. versus get super for the future so what are the what are the conversations that can be had now and if we look at some of those goals again i go back to what we said earlier break them down little incremental steps at the time in this city in sydney for example and it's the same in melbourne brisbane perth to save for a deposit is a big thing mm -hmm. and sometimes those big goals stop us from making any action or taking any action yeah but what we're saying is start small, build some confidence, puff our chest up a little bit more, and then we go to the next step and we get some momentum and, and we're off and running. So uh, tell us a little bit about Shadforth Financial Group and how you help your clients specifically in this wellbeing space. Yep. So Shadforth, we've been around for about 100 years mm. um, doing this. And, and again, we're really proud of that. And, and it's testimony to the value that we provide our clients. I, I think that that's important. I think the other part is we're an advisory business, Natasha. So what that means is, again, in the advice to one space or the advice to many space. So in the advice to one space, we have around about 120, 130 advisors across the country that work with individuals one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. Today, we're talking about the advice to many space in which we run specific financial wellbeing programs right. that are specifically designed to educate, equip, and empower employees to feel positive and, and, and attain well-being in the space. And um, look, again, the great news is no matter the size of the em employer, we have just uh, a couple of days ago, we were dealing with a 15-person a firm in inner Sydney. Uh, next week, we're engaging in a national firm, um, you know, with 1,000 employees. Mm. So it doesn't really sort of matter the size. Um, and I think the last thing I would say is I'm really fortunate. I've got a team across the country who are just itching to, help. to get out there and provide advice for all Australians. Which is a lovely segue into my next question. What do you love about what you're doing? I think if I go back to the start of my career, it was very much dealing with um, execs and uh, complex plans and, and that piece. I'm really thrilled that, look, why shouldn't all employees have access to this? Mm. Why should this be reserved for when we're just starting to approach retirement or, or we've already got money? Mm. Why shouldn't everybody have access to this? And, and we are thrilled, absolutely thrilled when we go out to employers. And oftentimes, I'll call it out, oftentimes it's the youngest, it's the brashest, 
Mm. You know, why shouldn't that next generation have access to all this? Yeah. Um, so I love it because I love seeing the light bulb go off and possibility open up for the, and all of a sudden it's a positive conversation. We get beautiful anecdotal feedback. Um, we get wonderful emails and notes back saying, thank God I've just cut up the credit cards mm. or, or we've, we've just signed on the contract on the bottom line for our house that we never thought we would have, or we've just put, um, you know, little Johnny into a school that we wanted, you know, we wanted to. And, and these are the real stories that have an impact that, you know, have us love what buzz. we do. Give you the buzz. Yeah, so on that note, how, what's the best way for someone to get in touch with you if they'd like to learn more? Sure. So uh, happy to take a call, one 308 440 Yep. Um, you can reach me in the email, david.harvey at sfg.com.au. Yeah. But Natasha, I'd also direct you to our website, which is all the W's, sfg.com.au. On there, there's plenty of tools that are available now. So it, it's all there. People can sort of start to have a bit of a look around and, and you know, feel empowered in the space. Mm. And I think what I've taken away from this conversation is it's never too late and it's never too little to take action around your finances. Would that be fair to say? Always a great place to start is today. Fantastic. It has been brilliant, as always, talking with you, David. I really appreciate you sharing your wisdom and insights. Um, I'm sure that this will resonate with a lot of people and uh, they, uh, I would encourage anyone to get in touch with you and uh, start to empower them and make sure that their finances are something they're really proud of rather than something that's worrying them. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Natasha. I really appreciate it. And look, I, I take my hand off uh, to you, you know, for making, um, making a difference in this space. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Take care and talk soon.